Hello and welcome to the Celtic Way morning briefing for Friday the 4th of August. I'm Aidan McDonald and today I'm joined by Alan Morrison aka Celtic by Numbers and from the Huddle Breakdown podcast. Alan, how are you? Yeah, great. Uh, thanks Aidan, thanks for having me on. No problem, no problem. Uh, there's, there's plenty for us to talk about today guys. A lot of different topics of course. We'll be looking ahead to the flag day opener tomorrow against Ross County. Reacting to some of Brendan Rodgers' press conference comments from yesterday and also the report that came out late last night about Celtic potentially bracing themselves for a bid for Carl Starfelt and his future being in kind of maybe some sort of doubt. But before we get into all that, guys, for anybody that's interested, it's in the ticker tape down below of this video and also in the link to the podcast description. Uh, it's a link to subscribe to the Celtic Way website, supporting talk call with journalism covering the club you all love. It's part of your subscription, which at the moment is £4 for four months access to the site. You'll get ad light coverage, you'll get data analysis from Alan, Juco James, match reaction from myself, Tony and Ryan, scouting reports from Stuart Ross, opinion columns from Kevin McKenna and so much more. So the link to do that, guys, is www.celticway.co.uk slash subscribe. So get yourself involved in that if you're interested. Now, uh, Alan, I guess just to sort of kick off, obviously, Brendan Rodgers had his kind of first, I suppose you could say, competitive press conference yesterday, having Callum McGregor obviously addressing the media just before uh, the first game of the season. And there was a few kind of interesting comments from Rodgers. He, he was kind of asked about... Where he was asked whether the squad's kind of where he wants it to be, and he said there's clear positions that are priorities for us that we would like to improve on. But I think the team in the squad were in a really good position before I came in. I needed to assess the group over a period of time, and I think over the course we will look to improve the squad further. I think the best time to do that is when you have had success, as that success is a moving target. I think the challenges this year will be even greater, so we have to make sure we can match those. I guess, sort of, just to kick off, Alan, I saw a brief reaction from you to Rogers' comments about transfers. It does seem like he's keen to sort of do a bit of more work in the market, even if we don't know particularly exactly what position he's referring to. Yeah, absolutely. And and, and firstly, I think this season we're going to have a lot more fun, uh, both in terms of uh, deciphering what Brendan Rodgers says in press conferences, as well as an analysing games tactically. So I think under uh, Ange Postacoglu, um, uh, one of the things I often said on the Huddle Breakdown was, you know, you don't have to work too hard to work out exactly what Ange was trying to say. He just used to say it, basically. <laughs> and, it, and, it, and he was very clear in his messaging. And I think that was one of his strengths as a, as a leader. Uh, was was very clear messaging to to the team exactly what his expectations were, and 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 in fact you know we'll, we'll, we'll no doubt go on to talk about the tactical side and preview of the game. But similarly on the tactical side, it, it, it was very straightforward in the sense of you know the expectations were clear. The way that Celtic played was quite very consistent. In fact, incredibly consistent, and so that didn't leave a lot of <laughs> room for speculation and and and, uh, and sort of deciphering. But I think Rogers is a very different uh, animal. So uh, I did read the transcript of his uh, press conference, and I I found it, uh, it it was it was hilarious in some ways because it was quite sort of almost David Brentish a little bit in the sense that I could think I knew what he was trying to say, but it was couched in quite a lot of uh, flowery language around about it. And uh, I, th I think, uh, but I think at the end of the day, what he was actually saying was exactly, I think you summarised it really well, actually, Aiden, which is which is good because that's, that's your job. But uh, no, you, you summarised it excellently. It's in terms of, you know, there are two or three positions that the club are looking at. He's assessed the squad. The squad were in a good place. Um, but, you know, let's be honest here. We've got over 30 teams. Teams as well, and that's too many. So there's a lot of work to be done on the outgoing side um, before we even think about putting more people onto the wage bill. So there's, I think there's a, I think there's a tremendous amount of work still to do, and I think we might be surprised at the volume of activity that has yet to to manifest. Yeah, obviously there's kind of still just over three weeks left in the transfer window, so there obviously still is time for ins and outs, as you say. I think fans were maybe hoping for a wee bit more activity than there's been now, and that kind of seems to have been the general consensus online from what I've seen in kind of Ryan as well, I think would probably echo that sentiment. But as you say, it is important that Celtic do get players off the wage bill. We probably don't want to go over too much old ground. People probably know exactly who I'm going to mention here, but guys like Ayeti, guys like Sorrow, McCarthy, 
etc. It is, it is important that Celtic do try and get them off the wage bill. You know, I'd imagine without knowing the specifics, there is a kind of significant outlay in terms of wages for those players. And obviously last season, two out of three of them were out on loan. Obviously a portion of their wages getting paid, but I think it's not unfair to assume that Celtic were still paying the majority of that. Whereas whether it leads to them getting paid off or you can get a club that can come in and take them, which could be more difficult, I think it is important that Celtic resolve it because those are kind of three players that, as far as I'm aware, weren't in Japan. You never really see them in any of the training stuff and I appreciate the stuff that's always done on YouTube. A lot of it is probably deliberate and it's only wee short clips, but you never really see any of those guys involved in any capacity. So it really is kind of just taking up a wage. Hopefully that is something that Celtic can get sorted and you'd imagine Brendan Rodgers will be keen to make that a priority because he knows that will free up more wages for him to be able to sign players. Yeah, and actually it's not Brendan Rodgers' job. I mean, Brendan Rodgers needs to identify who in the squad um, is surplus to requirements and then it's Michael Nicholson's job to to move them on. You know, I think, that, again, this is a, a change that we'll see over the season is that Brendan Rodgers is very much, I would say, I would say an elite level coach, as in on the training ground with the players. That's what we've got, as opposed to a more sort of om, om, omnipotent kind of manager, leader, old school, if you like, that, that Andrew Postacoglu kind of was. Uh, I think Rodgers just identified these are the players that I want to keep. These are the ones that I can work with. And these are the ones that um, you know. I don't think we're going to fit in. Then it's it's over to Michael Nicholson to uh, move these players on, and it's not it's not always straightforward. I mean, Celtic generally will pay quite well, and uh, players uh, for a variety of reasons may may hold out for, like you say, either payoffs or, or or a better deal somewhere else, which might be tricky given, like you say, some of the players you've mentioned haven't racked up a lot of meaningful minutes in the last year. So it's a tricky job. Uh, it's it, it's, it's I've, I give Peter Lowell a lot of stick, but I'll. One thing I will say in balance is he was very effective at moving players on as well and I'm getting getting good value for some players also, so in that regard. So, yeah, lots of work to do on that side. Um, I mean, I think, again, if you dig dig into what Roger said, like you said before, there's probably a few positions that still need filling. I think um, we've all had a go at our preseason predictions over the, the weekend, and I know uh, one of the questions was, you know, which positions do you think they were? For me, it's it's... It has to be goalkeeper. It's an absolute must position for me. Um, I think we saw against Wolves um, in particular, uh, it was quite alarming actually to me, uh, the, the degree to which I felt Joe Hart's physical speed reaction to be sort of de degraded. Um, and also, you know, his passing was very ragged and he looked short of confidence actually. Um, and listen, you know, age age grade decline, age decline is a natural thing, and it can suddenly happen very quickly. Under Rogers, we saw that very very uh, publicly with with Colo Turi, who came in, played very well for a couple of months, and then suddenly, when the Champions League group stages happened, it, it was very obvious that he, his days at that level were, were 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 done. So it can happen quite quickly. I think you know, the left for me, the left back area is another one. Because again, I think Rogers likes um, a mix of power plays, technicality, players, and I don't think we've got that in that position. And and then possibly, I, for, again, for me, my own opinion is that we need that we still need an athletic box to box type of central midfielder. It's something we don't really have in the squad, and it's and it's essential at Champions League level. So I think there's a load of work still to do, both outgoing and uh, incoming. And uh, I'm I'm as guilty. Any other fan sometimes behaving like a little child that you know have we uh, you know we're not done yet where's it where's the where's the next anything to look at you know if you look at even the English Premier League uh, a lot of clubs have only just started to to do their business um, you know it's easy to do business when you're dealing with uh, players that are unwanted or out of contract and so forth as we've seen. Um, it's not really business when you're trying to buy players that are wanted by their clubs and in demand by other clubs and are highly valued and they know they're highly valued and do they want to come to Scotland and all of those things. So it's not straightforward and I think the market we're shopping in, uh, I expect to be the market that's probably more difficult to get deals done and they'll more likely go up towards the end of the window, by which time we still wouldn't have started Champions League matches. So I think, you know, just need to be patient, but I think these things are happening. Yeah, you're right to touch on the, the Champions League aspect, Alan. That, I suppose, does give Celtic a bit more of a confidence boost in terms of not having to play competitive games yet. Of course, the first one 
will be tomorrow against Ross County in previous years. You'd probably already be at least one qualified in by now, potentially two, depending how the sort of season was scheduled. And that would mean that really business would have to have been done, you know, in the first couple of weeks of the transfer window being open. So, yeah, you, you are right to point that out that there is still a bit, a bit more time and probably a bit, a bit of patience as needed. But I, I'm, I can relate you as well. Sometimes you kind of end up throwing the toys at the pram because you just want all the sort of players to come in at the one time. But look, we understand that that isn't the way football really works. And particularly in some markets, Celtic aren't just going to go out and spend, you know, 35, 40 million on a player. So they do need something that you'd be a wee bit more clever with the sort of players they're bringing in. But yeah, fingers crossed we will see a wee bit more uh, sort of ins and outs over the next few weeks. Uh, I guess while we're on the topic of transfers, Alan, it's probably worth touching on the kind of latest about Carol Staff. There was a report that came out last night saying, just make sure I'm not misquoting this, saying that Celtic were kind of expecting a bid for the defender. Obviously, there was the stuff about potentially going to Spartak Moscow a couple of weeks ago. That did kind of seem to be shot down. Didn't seem like there was a lot in that. Maybe the, the only sort of link there was the fact they had played in Russia previously. I think probably if it was going into that too much, there's plenty of logistical reasons why I don't think that particular transfer will happen. But there's been a lot of maybe discussions about Starfield. I know Ryan did a newsletter on him so, uh, not long after or not long before the Wills game, kind of in defence of him, saying that there was some fans that as soon as the sort of Spartak thing came up, people were maybe keen for him to leave. Uh, I know James Daly, he recently did a tactical breakdown for us, kind of comparing uh, radars with Carol Starfield and uh, Mike Nevroski, and he kind of came to the conclusion that obviously Starfield has been an important player for Celtic, but it might be worth giving Nevroski a kind of goal with, a goal with Carter Vickers from uh, the kind of start of the campaign. I guess, firstly, what's your kind of general overall thoughts on Starfield, Alan? And secondly, how would you feel if he was potentially to move on in the, over the next three weeks? Yeah, so, I mean, for people that maybe, and I'm sure the majority of people that are watching have not seen the huddle break down, um, I, I'll, I'm on record as being fairly sceptical about Carl Starfield. I have been from day one, actually. And in fact, um, James and I on, on the huddle break down more or less gave up on him after the first six with after the first six months um what i will say is i think he is a player that has improved and and the data shows that and i've absolutely happily acknowledge that and that's great to see love it um i think last season um you know he formed a consistent partnership with carter vickers i think if again all context in the round some of that was to do with you know postacoglu's system was well ingrained i think starfelt's um you know, the defence became a lot more settled. Starfelt's role became a lot clearer and, and simplified. And in many ways, he was very good at decluttering and, and, and keeping it simple as far as players and, and what he expected of them. And I think Starfelt you know, uh, rose up to that challenge and became, as you say, a consistent performer last season. Um, all the data analysis and benchmarking that I do on centre-halves, and where, again, caveat is... Assessing defenders using data is very tricky uh, because defending is a collective thing. Um, and obviously you're looking at individual on ball metrics and on, on most of the most of the defending, in fact, the vast majority of defending is it happens without the ball and is to do with your positioning, your your position relative to your teammates, your position relative to the opponents, your decision making about when to press, when not to press, when to go forward, when not to go forward, etc. All of those things, um, and so you tend to have to infer from the data some of those. Um, I mean, James touched upon uh, something that Statsbomb used, which is kind of individual error rate. I, I calculate something very similar, uh, and Star have felt uh, traditionally has been that one of the highest uh, in the group, uh, really, in fact, the highest of any any Celtic player. I've I've ever collected data from, and that that was always always a problem, and that was really stemming from the nature of the player, which is he's, he's what I call a very aggressive front foot defender. He wants to engage uh, the opponent quick uh, early. He wants to he wants to attack the ball aggressively. Um, I, I this is just a personal thing that that I get very nervous with that type of defender because I think the the you know the ability for them to get drawn under the ball to be drawn into a challenge and then, you know, to be, you know, someone to skip round them or pass round them quickly is there with better level opponents. And we've seen in Scotland, especially because he's not particularly a big, a big man, Starfelt, 
um, although he's strong and he's quick, um, that you know he was often beaten in the air, and was in fact that most teams targeted that side of the defence for that reason. So, you know, on, but on the other hand, his, his recovery pace was good. When he did get his aggression right, he could really turn the ball over quickly and then, you know, release it. His, his passing actually became pretty good, actually. So, you know, uh, in the round, I would say it was a player that Celtic improved. Uh, but I don't think we're going to change the nature of the player. He's 28, 27, 28 now. I don't think he's he's, go, he's going to develop in that sense much further. There's probably a higher ceiling to Navrocki. Um So in terms of if I were to benchmark Starfell amongst centre-halves for Celtic over the last years that I've collected data, which is about seven or eight seasons now, he would be, he's moved up from being, in all honesty, in the first season, one of the weaker centre-halves that we've had into that sort of middle group which is your sort of Boyatas, your Semyonovich, your Sviachenkos, that kind of thing. Um, but but Carter Vickers is up in the sort of top right corner as being one of the best defenders, central defenders that we've had at Celtic Park. He's kind of equivalent personal data to, to a sort of Van Dyke type of player. So I personally have always said that we need to try and get another equivalent to Carter Vickers alongside him. Uh, to really be uh, an effective Champions League level defence, at least have a chance of repelling some of those attacks. And so if he did move on, if the price point was good, given he's 28 years old, I don't think there's a lot of development left in him. I'm not sure he's a Rodgers type of technical centre-half. And therefore, uh, providing Celtic got good money for him, I'd, I'd wish him well. And, and I would hope that we would invest in, a, in, as I say, in another player who's more more likely or nearer to the level that Carter Vickers has achieved consistently over the last two seasons. I've kind of maybe any of the brief data you've looked at for Navrovsky so far, and I appreciate he's only played one game for uh, Celtic, but obviously we had him kind of scouted by Stuart Ross at the time, and he seemed to think he could potentially be someone that would maybe be challenging for a starting place. Do you think, based off maybe any sort of brief data you've looked at him or any sort of profiles that you've read, he could be somebody that could, you know, play... 30, well, 40, 50 games beside uh, Cameron Carter pickers this season, or would you still be hoping that maybe Celtic are bringing another centre back in, regardless of what happens with Carol Starfield? Yeah, so I mean, I, I, I'll be honest, I've, I don't have any um, insight beyond what I've read from Stuart and from James on this. So, really, just reflecting, as I say, what they said, which is, you know, he's a 22 year old player, we've paid much the same money as we paid for Starfelt, which is a big investment for Celtic. So I think, uh, you know, this is a, a serious investment, if you like. This isn't a project player. This is somebody that, that Celtic um, see a lot of potential in. Um, I would expect because of the fact that he started his career in Germany and played in Poland, that he's very well scouted and he's very well known by the club. Uh, and therefore, I would have confidence that, you know, they know what they're getting in, in him. Uh, the, the, my first impression, based on whatever it was, forty-five minutes against Bill uh, against Athletic, was you know he seemed he seemed a, a calm, well-organised player, which I like in a defender, unfussy, you know, uh, uncomplicated, uh, keeps it simple, does the basic things well. That's the, my sort of starting benchmark for a for a defender. Um, but you know, I, other than that, I think I would recommend people read read Stewart's um, scouting report and read the benchmarking that, that James did. That there are thorough investigations based on uh, a lot of a lot of data, and and I think the I would be hopeful, uh, and it'll be interesting to see if he starts uh, starts. To... Yeah, and uh, those sort of two pieces that you mentioned there, Alan. Uh, once again, guys, they can be found on the website as part of your subscription. It's currently four pound for four months that we're offering. Uh, the link to that is in the ticker tape down below and also in the description of this video. It's www.celticway.co.uk slash subscribe. We really appreciate it, guys. Anybody that can subscribe, it allows us to be able to do the morning briefing Monday to Friday, uh, the weekend match reaction, myself, Ryan, Tony, and also other feature videos. So get yourself involved, guys, if you haven't already. But I think I'm just going to pull up a couple of comments, Alan, maybe I'm based more around the sort of discussion that we were having on transfers at the start rather than maybe the Starfield specifically, but uh, AJSC Tech says, we had two competitive first 11s against Bilbao, so we'll be fine in the first four SPFL games, but we do need two or three first team upgrades, which is maybe kind of roughly what you and I were saying across probably our predictions and also today, Alan, that kind of 
does seem to be the general consensus, doesn't it? That particularly domestically, the Celtic squad is is strong, but maybe to take it to that next level in the Champions League now, what exactly that means in terms of being competitive is probably a whole other discussion for a different podcast, maybe. But it does feel that two or three signs fans might be a wee bit more sort of happy that the club is sort of investing a bit more to try and be a wee bit more competitive at the top level. Yeah, as I say, I'm, you know, I've, I've committed that to writing, so I'll stand behind it in terms of the three areas I'd like to see uh, strengthened for sure. Um, you know, when it comes to the Champions League, as I've said before, the, the, one of the, the most, one of the most, probably the most fascinating aspect of, of Ange Postecoglou's reign was we really got to see what I'd call the sort of system versus personnel sort of debate. You know, almost like a living, breathing. Um, you know, uh, experiment, if you like, a laboratory test of, because I've never seen a Celtic team in my lifetime that is so systematically cohesive as under Postacoglu. And you saw that he was very much somebody who recruited people that would fit into that system and were willing to do what he wanted them to do. And he would often pick a player who would be willing to adjust their game accordingly to fit into the system um, based on their personality, based on their willingness to to adhere to that system, even if they weren't necessarily the best technical player, maybe uh, available, I don't think we'll see that with Rogers. I think with Rogers wants a different profile of player, and so I think we're in we're in a completely different world now. And and I think that Rogers will put more emphasis on 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 player ability as well as uh, their their propensity to. You know, fit in. Uh, obviously, that's got to be key. He's more concerned with flexibility over rigidity, in a sense. So, I think we're we're, we're going we're going to see a sort of very different approach. And 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 what I, what I, what I really wanted to say on the Postecoglou piece was what I think we sh- was shown in a very small sample, six games, and Celtic had their moments and they played well in a lot of, a lot of the games. Was that despite the absolutely brilliant cohesiveness that and and understanding that Foster Cogley gave to that side and the consistency with which we performed, you know, we, we were a long way short of especially the top two teams in that group. And it, to me, it was a very interesting insight into how far an excellent system can take you. But if you simply don't have good enough players, there is a, li- there is a ceiling, there's a ceiling there. And I think we saw that we hit that ceiling very hard last season, you know, five goals to Leipzig, eight goals to Madrid. So, again, back to the recruitment, irrespective of how cohesive and clever it is, I think we'll see a lot more variety tactically in terms of how he sets up the team dependent on the opposition, especially at Champions League level. I think we'll see more counter-attacking play. We might see five at the back, three at the back. We might see more variety of shape. Um, We won't progress any further given the personnel in the squad today. And I would even argue we're weaker now than we were last season, purely on the basis that, that if again, and I did, I did do this, I did do a bit of analysis on this from a data perspective. I looked at you know how far did players' performances drop from a productivity perspective? So this is both defensive stats and attacking stats. How far did they drop playing in Scotland versus the Champions League? And and and, and given that I keep keep banging on about how this is a game of tiny margins, the average drop off in productivity was about 40%, which is enormous playing in the Champions League versus playing in, in the, uh, in the, in the, uh, in the Scottish League. The one player who, who, who most managed to bridge that gap was Jota. He, he, he was able to get somewhere near his Scottish levels of productivity in Europe. Um, and of course, we've lost him. And the other one uh, would, would, was Aaron Moy. Because Aaron Moy, you know, for all he's a little bit ungainly and a little bit slow, um, is incredibly intelligent, incredibly experienced player who's played, you know, at the high, highest level, World Cups, and knows how to, understands what's going on around him. He's a player who feels the game and can influence the tempo, which is crucial at that Champions League. Both of those players, I would argue, are probably the two most effective Champions League players that we had. So I think we're weaker. So I'm sure Rogers knows that better than me. 
Um, and what, so what, what we need to do is we just need to simply, I say simply, I say simply, but it's not simple. It's a simple thing to say, difficult thing to do. We just need to get better quality players in and then come up with a, a, an approach that's cohesive and is going to be good enough to both stifle Champions League level teams and provide the threat, which Postacoglu's team did do. We were excellent going forward in that Champions League campaign. We were, we were unable to stop teams uh, creating chances, unfortunately, at the other end. Yeah, I think probably most people would agree with that, Alan, in terms of what you're saying, that Celtic went in those games last season, the Champions League at times, and I don't want to go back to that shot to the Nescaway game, but how they didn't win that, you know, 4 or 5-1, I think it'll probably continue to give me emails, but yeah, it, I think we, we did see that they were making a wee bit of progress, but there was obviously still a clear gap in quality. I, I, as you always would expect at the kind of top level with the Champions League, but it's obviously something that's definitely grown over the last sort of five to ten years. We've got another wee uh, kind of, or this thing more of a tactical question, Alan, that's from Seamus McKenna. He's saying, do you think BR will consider, or Brendan Odders will consider playing with three at the back? And he, as Seamus, thinks that would open up all sorts of opportunities. What's your uh, thoughts on that, Alan? I don't know he has done at Leicester. Um, you know, we, we had a, a, a lad from a Leicester City analyst, data analyst on the show and he was talking about that. A lot of his changes were in relation to, especially when he was playing against some of the top six teams in the English Premier League and also in Europe because uh, you know, Leicester got into Europe uh, under Rodgers regularly. And, um, but also in relation to a response to injuries. So, um, you know, he, he, he'd he even started playing inverted fullbacks, but when certain key players got injured, he reverted to a different a different system, which I think highlights, A, that Rodgers is willing to do that, and B, that he responds to conditions and situations in a way that we'll, we'll see more flexibility. So I wouldn't rule playing three at the back out. I don't necessarily see the benefit of it in Scotland. Um, I, I, you know, to me, that's, I think, I think, you, you could almost see it happening a little bit like it did under Rodgers the first time where, um, uh, you know, Bitton or, or Brown would fall back into a three and that allowed Tierney and and, and whoever was playing on the right side to, to bomb forward and effectively create a three. Um, and, but we saw that a little bit under, under anyway, stayed in, in position two fullbacks would invert, McGregor would, would still be a little bit deeper. You'd have this sort of two, three, five attacking shape. But again, I don't get too hung up about these things um, in terms of shape because really it's about getting as many players forward, exploiting as many spaces, getting as many one-to-one -one situations and getting as many overloads as you can. And it's really how you do that. Is a, there's lots of ways to do that. What would you call that shape? I, I don't really care. Um, out of possession, what's your shape? I think is more an, an interesting question in terms of where shape becomes more important. And, and often um, under Postacoglu and Rogers, actually, Celtic fell back into a 4-4-2 out of possession uh, because it's something which is intuitive to most players and it's it's a system which actually um, protects the width of the pitch quite quite effectively out of, out of possession. So will he play three at the back? I don't think we've got the players to do it necessarily at the moment. Um, will, will he consider it based on personnel availability? And tactically, in terms of re responses to who we're playing, I'm sure he absolutely will. And we might, it's something we might see. And again, I come back to listening to what Rogers is saying. He wants to buy players who can, if required, play in different systems. You know, we do have Alistair Johnson. Alistair Johnson can play the right side of a three, for example. He would be somebody that would that would fit well with that. I think I would worry that we don't seem to. I don't, I don't know that we've got any natural to start. Um, so it, it would be something that I think would be surprising, especially domestically, but I wouldn't rule it out uh, based on what it sees a particular game. So, yeah, it could be maybe a tweak we do see at, at, at some point. I, I think you, you, know, you were talking about the, the person from West that you had on that was kind of discussing it, and I have seen a wee bit of kind of thinking about it online, the point that you mentioned on Alistair Johnson, that could be, our old, maybe he would potentially feature in, in, in that back three. But obviously there would be concerns, as you say, maybe about ha not having enough kind of natural wing-backs at the club to be involved in that formation, like a sort of Keon Tierney type, which I'll, I don't like to compare anybody to because I don't think he's a player Keon Tierney is. But, you know, it's just kind of the logical jump that I always make when I'm thinking about full-backs or wing-back or anything, whatever you want to call it, that he's always a guy I kind of jump to because of how good he was. But... I guess if we kind of just move on now, now to the preview for Ross County, obviously competitive football back, yes, 
finally. I ha- I'm saying that I have actually enjoyed preseason. It's always good getting to see the team after a break. And, you know, the last couple of summers have been a bit longer without Celtic because they've not had to dive into Champions League qualifiers at the start of July. So there's not been, you know, loads of friendlies at the beginning of June and the players only getting a couple of weeks off. It's good that they're getting more rest, of course, more recovery time. I appreciate guys like Cal McGregor, etc. cetera, we're away with Scotland, but obviously they kind of joined at a slightly different time in terms of the group. But yeah, I guess overall, Alan, I take it you'll be like myself, excited that the competitive football is back tomorrow. Yeah, for sure, and and also like you, <laughs> I like enjoyed all the preseason games because uh, I'm you know I'm always looking for little hints and tips as to how things might be different. You know how players have sort of developed or in, not in Johar's case. Um, so yeah, so I, I, enjoyed, I mean obviously they're frustrating because there's a lot of changes, there's a lack of cohesion, etc. Um, there's some silliness and stupid goals given away and all that. But actually, all the games, uh, all the preseason games are. Very enjoyable. Just, just on the on on a sporting level, they were they were good fun. I think a lot, a lot of them, and uh, I think some of that is to do with the fact that I think under Rogers we'll, we'll see a slightly more aggressive style. Uh, I think you know, Rogers is. If there was a criticism of Rogers in his first stint, it was that as his kind of period of management went on, we seemed to become increasingly pedantic about the way that we played and the sort of horseshoe of utility that I like to. To, to use in terms of going in and out and round and back and so forth, looking, probing for openings. And then what Postacoglu seemed to get right, I think, the balance almost perfect in Scotland especially, was <clears throat> the balance between control, holding the ball, not giving possession away, and penetration, which is being aggressive in your in your forward passing. He seemed to get that spot on. Um, I think with the Rodgers we might see, um, I think he's really, really... Uh, you know the two players in in preseason are absolutely been fine. You know, Maeda and Kyogo, and I think you know the, that pace. And I mean, what manager wouldn't love to see that sort of pace up front? So the, the idea that we might hit teams quickly with more direct play, I think, is something we might see. Probably not against Ross County. They're probably going to sit in. They're probably going to play deep. The opportunity to do that isn't going to be there. So I think we're going to be back to more sort of patient, patient football. But it'll be interesting to see. How he, because what, again, what Postacoglu was good at was getting at least five players at any one time when when we had the ball in the opposition half, getting those five players getting the goal. It was it was, it was a you know it was, it was a lot of numbers. It was quite overwhelming for the opposition. So it'll be interesting to see how how Rogers approaches that. Problem. It'll be a problem tomorrow. It'll be a deep defence. It'll be a packed defence. It'll be you know an aggressive pressing. Uh, as soon as we get anywhere near the eighteen yard box, it'll be a lot of. Uh, uh, you know, a, a lot of players packed around, and I've seen it many times before. So the fascination for me will be to see how how does Rogers set up to combat that. Yeah, I think how how he does deal with the sort of team sitting deep, maybe like with two banks of five. Really, I, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on North County's tactics, but I think it's fair to say that's probably how we're going to set up tomorrow. We know Malky McKay is quite a defensive manager, and look, it, they were obviously last season. They end up in the playoffs against Thistle, but previously he did well with Ross County. And I, I do appreciate they have a, a decent enough, maybe size budget to some of the other teams down the bottom of the table, but he still uh, he still did well overall. He managed to keep them up as well last season, which probably after those after the sort of first day away against Partick Thistle and uh, a good chunk of that first half of the second leg, I don't think many people have seen that was happening. So he's a more than capable coach. I think it will be an interesting game and in how Rodgers uses Kyogo, maybe as you say, not as much in this game tomorrow, but over the course of the competitive season is definitely going to be an interesting point for people. I guess maybe just a couple of questions about the starting. Why not tomorrow, Ryan? Eh, Ryan, sorry, Alan. <laughs> eh, at right back, do you think that will be Tomoki Awata or Anthony Ralston? Yeah, good question. So I, th- I, th- I think we we'll, might be a few surprises tomorrow. I think Rogers will make his mark in some respects. I think we'll get an insight a little bit into what he alluded to yesterday, which is you know, it wasn't just about players who I think you you listed a few of them earlier that I think we could all say quite obviously are not part of the the plans. But you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a few more you know outgoings towards the end of the season. We, we've talked about Starfelt possibly. There might be one or two others. You know, because I think Rogers' assessment wasn't just of players that are kind of squad players, but also players that you know maybe have been in the first team. So I'm expecting. I'm, I'm well. I, I 
personally just have a feeling there'll be a few little surprises. Now, right back is an interesting one. Obviously, everyone picked up on Iwata misjudging one uh, in the friendly game. But otherwise, at right back, he'd been a, a really effective player. I think Iwata is a player that Rodgers will really like because, again, I come back to flexibility, but he's also got a combination, Iwata, of he's technically good. He's, he's pretty st sort of strong physical player as well. Um, you know, Ralston never lets Celtic down. There's absolutely no risk in playing him against Ross County, you would think, uh, providing he's up to speed. But having played in most of the pre-season games at right back, I, I, I'm, I'm going to. I'm, I'm, my thinking is he might stick with Iwata for the for the game tomorrow. Yeah, I think he might be wanting to try build a, a wee bit of consistency. Obviously. We kind of all do recognise it when Alistair Johnson's fit, exactly when that's going to be. <clears throat> we, we don't know. I think the sort of comments that were coming out from Rodgers when he was he did a press conference as part of the training camp in Portugal, he'd said three months. I, I don't know if there's been any development on that since, but as far as I know, that's kind of still the general consensus. So it'll be interesting to see what he does with that position. But I, I completely agree with you. As much as he did kind of get caught under the ball a wee bit for the goal against Atletico Bilbao, or athletic club, I should say, sorry. Uh, he, overall, he's been pretty effective at right back. And he, I think at Yokohama F Man was he, he did play in defence a bit. I think it was more at centre back, but he also did feature at full back at times as well. It was obviously the midfield role that he looked relatively tidy in when he came on in those games last season. I think particularly the cameos against uh, Rangers in the League Cup final and also in the semi final, two high pressure games where there was only a goal in it. He seemed to come on and sort of very calm, his passing was very good, they didn't like the occasion was getting to him, so Awata's a player I'm kind of excited to get a full run at it this season, exactly in what position I'm maybe unclear, but yeah, I think it's very entirely plausible that he does play at a right back tomorrow. I guess the other question I was going to ask about positions, also another defender, beside Cameron Carter-Vickers, if we assume that he's still going to be fit enough to start the game, he obviously played uh, against Athletic Club midweek, just said that he and Ralston Starfield, all the guys that were carrying a wee knock, came through that game okay. So, do you think it will be Navroski beside Cameron Carter Vickers that one, or do you think it will be Carol Starfield? So, I think the defence is the big, the big area, the big question mark at the moment for a mixture of reasons. Um, my impression was that you know he got a really good workout against Athletic. You know, he was challenged. You know, he was under a lot of pressure. Uh, very high, very hard, and very effectively, and I thought he, he did damn well actually in that half. I think if he's he's a, he's a sort of player that you obviously if he's fit and available, then you play him for sure. So, so, so yeah, I said I think there'll be some surprising changes. When I think about the defence, I think the debate in maybe in the Rogers' mind might be how many changes can I safely can I make really? So you, you, you're going to go safe. Uh, you're going to go safe. It would be Hart, Ralston, Carter, Vickers, Starfelt, Taylor. It would be the safest option, right? I just think there's a lot of um, doubt in my mind there. That's actually what it will be. But you know, to make too many changes might be a folly. But I could make a case for actually the starting back line being either Segrist or Bain. I don't know which one. But as I say, I thought Hart's performance against Wolves was al alarming. Uh, really, and I don't think we want to be in an Alan McGregor situation, you know, this season with Joe Hart. We just don't want to be. We don't want to be in that situation. That's that's not good. A good place to be, um, you know. So it could be it could be Segrist or Bain and goal. It could be Iwata, Carter, Vickers, Navrotki, and it could be Burnaby at left back because again, Burnaby to me is more of a Rogers type of player. He's you know he's defensively gets caught out, he makes poor decisions, gives the ball away a lot, all of that. I don't think he will play Burnaby, but I, 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 a little bit of me kind of wants him to play because I think he'll, he brings a bit of chaos and against a packed defence where he's not going to really be having to do a lot of defending, his kind of interesting runs that he makes, the positions he pops up in, the speed and aggression with which he attacks the ball and attacks space, I think make him um, uh, certainly a challenger. And also, Frankly, Greg Taylor in preseason was was really well off the great, the very consistent Greg Taylor we've come to, to to know over the last couple of seasons. So, if I was picking it on form, that that was what I'd go with. And I think you know Navrocki over Starfelt is more around just the consistent chatter we've talked about around his 
you know, it's Starfoot moving on. If Rocky's a big money signing, if he's fit, you know, get him in there. Home to Ross County, you'd think, is a, is a low risk option. Now, I've gone through the whole of the back four there, and every single one of the players that I've said could play is a risk associated with it. And you know, football managers tend to be kind of risk averse in that sense. So, on the one hand, it could be a very predictable safe back four. On the other hand, it could be packed full of surprises. Um, I think there'll be one or two surprises. Yeah, I think, look, as much as it's the first game of the season, as you point out, Ross County at home is maybe an opportunity to try a couple of different things. Uh, and Rogers might do that. It's definitely not going to be easy for Ryan and myself to do a predicted 11s for this game. It was a... Uh, at times with kind of Angela last season, it was pretty set, you know, for maybe nine, even at least nine of the players, and there was maybe a couple of positions you could tweak. But you know, it will be it will be interesting to see what happens. I I guess just before we finish this up, could I get a, a prediction for you uh, from you for tomorrow? Yeah, I mean, like, your flag day tends to be a kind of joyous occasion, and a bit like the end of season, the last game of the season, we tend to tend to usually put on a performance. So, um, but on the other hand. You know, Ross County are already four games, competitive games into their season. It's the first game of the season. They're full of hope, fitness and and all that good stuff. So they'll make it very, very difficult, I'm sure. I think, you know, for me, this, this sort of safe-ish prediction is probably a 2-0 home win uh, in that regard. But uh, as I say, I other thing that I'll predict is a few lineup surprises. I think Rogers will make his mark. There'll be a few indicators about some of the future direction that the squad's going to take in there. I'll I'll go one more better than you, and I'll go for three now. Hopefully, <laughs> yeah, a, a nice sort of Fair soft start to the season. <laughs> but yeah, either either scoreline, I think most people would be happy with sort of kicking off with a wins ideal, particularly with Rangers playing there. You know, later on tomorrow night, it, I get come on. It allows you to sort of just put a wee bit of pressure on early, which is what you need. But yeah, guys, uh, thanks very much for joining us today. Once again, uh, for anybody that's interested, ticker tape down below, support uh, top quality journalism from the Celtic Way, covering the club you all love. It includes data pieces from Alan, James Daly, scouting reports from Stuart Ross, match reaction from myself, Ryan and Tony, opinion pieces from Kevin McKenna. The current offer we're doing is £4 for four months. The link's in the ticker tape and also in the description down below. It's www.celticway.co.uk slash subscribe. At the weekend, or I should say tomorrow, because it is Friday, uh, you know, Ryan will be providing match reaction from the game. And we also have a, a special guest coming on, the Celtic Moments That Made Me, on Sunday. So stay tuned for that. That'll be going live at 6am on the YouTube on Sunday. But uh, until then, you subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the thumbs up button, follow Alan on Twitter, subscribe to the Huddle Breakdown. It's a really good podcast that gives you a sort of data breakdown of, of all things Celtic. That's in the link in this description here. But, uh, Alan, thanks very much for joining us, mate. Always a pleasure. Yeah, no, thanks, Aidan. Thanks very much. Cheers, guys. We'll see you later.